Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 167. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co-founder of Lend It Fintech. Today's show is sponsored by Lend It Fintech USA 2019, the world's leading event in financial services innovation. It's coming up on April 8th and 9th, 2019 at Moscone West in San Francisco. We've recently opened registration as well as speaker applications. You can find out more by going to lendit.com slash USA. Today on the show, I am delighted to welcome Charles Anderson. He is the CEO and founder of Currency. Now, Currency is a fascinating company. They are actually the the world's first fintech platform focused on the equipment finance space. It's a really fascinating space because it's it's so big. It's much much bigger than I than I expected it would be, and it is very much a paper based, you know, traditional kind of way of doing business. And currency is out to try and digitize this. And they've been going for a few years now. And we talked with Charles about you know who are the major players, what's the state of the equipment finance industry today, and what are the big pain points, and what is currency doing to solve of those pain points. Uh, we, we talk a little bit about data analytics and what they're doing and the, the organization CEMC that Charles recently helped found. And uh, we talk about the, his vision for the future of his company. It was a fascinating interview. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Charles. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's, a, it's an honor. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to get these things started by uh, giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself and what you've done in your career to date. Sure. So originally from the Bay Area, I went to undergrad at San Diego State. I always had a deep passion for specialty finance. And uh, with how I, how I grew up, an important part of my story is I saw at an early age the importance of timely access to capital, which is to me more important than access to capital. I mean, mm-hmm. It's more important to have a dollar when you need it than a dollar when you don't need it. And so that's always kind of shaped my my worldview. So uh, out of undergrad, I I jumped to the mortgage industry. Um, It was an interesting period of time. It was 2004, 2005. I started the mortgage industry, worked for a a large bank for a while, and then left and started my own mortgage company. And that uh, eventually I decided to to slow down, wind down, because I had an opportunity to go to to business school at at Stanford. Um, Out of Stanford Business School, I launched a, um, an investment vehicle called a search fund, and really that was kind of my, my stepping stone into currency. Um, not well known, but I actually tried to purchase currency from the founder of the business back in 2011, uh, ended up coming on as a partner instead. But that's my, like, I guess, quick Cliff Notes version of how I ended up down in LA with currency. Okay, so then, so tell us a little bit about that. I, d- I actually didn't know there was a, there was a founder before you of of the business. So tell us a little bit about the story about how how you got started and how that business began. Well, it's a critical part of the currency story, uh, and um, the way that I explain the business is we actually started as a, a finance company as a as a fin before we became fintech. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the roots of the business go back to two thousand and one, actually through predecessor businesses. And early, the early days of currency were known by a different name, a company called um, CapNet, actually, different business entirely. But that business was really an equipment finance brokerage where there were, there were four guys in a, in a building that were originating small balance equipment transactions and selling them to banks. So this is the early 2000s and technology wasn't what it was today. Most of the business was done over fax and, and mail. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, the business was done over mail when I joined in 2011, 2012. And so the business was, uh, was a nice little cottage business that they were, they were taking advantage of an opportunity in the market, which was banks needed assets, assets generating yield. And so these, um, these, these four guys in the room were, were finding businesses that needed to finance equipment and then finding banks. And this is an important part of the story because um, we actually still have a lot of those banking relationships that we set up you know, 15 plus years ago now. And that's really what helped us get through uh, the financial crisis in a lot of ways. But mm-hmm. those those deep embedded banking relationships, and so in 2005, uh, when Blake Johnson, who I call the founder of, of the business, joined, he helped to drive scale to the organization, and so Blake grew the business from really four employees to you know call 60, 70 employees and a north of 100 million of originations at the time, uh, and and grew the business until about 2009. In 2009, the company took a, a material 
step back um, to right size the organization because nobody knew how bad the financial crisis was going to get. Right. And so in 2009, 10, 11, banks were still buying paper, but with banks going out of business overnight, you never knew when your liquidity and funding was going to shut off. Mm -hmm. So Blake actually really wound down the company, started a new business uh, known as IMCA Capital. And that business was, was really about four people when I joined. So I was the fifth employee of currency uh, in 2012. Uh, and the, the business that I joined was very similar to the business that was originally founded in 2001. Okay, so then how then what changed and how did you how did you pivot to where you are today? So the first chapter when I joined the business um, was to really understand okay what what went wrong I mean, and you could say well things didn't go wrong but we weren't um, as an organization where we wanted to be so I, I dug into the business and dug into the portfolio and one of the conclusions which was incredibly insightful was um, there were two things that were very special about the company one was the data set around how to acquire customer marketing. And the other was the banking relationships. Mm -hmm. Both I knew from my experience in specialty finance that were almost impossible to replicate. Uh, it would take a decade and a financial crisis to, to, re to recreate that. So that was pretty special because now you know how to acquire a customer and you know your lifetime value, another way to say it. So one first thing they did was I dug into the portfolio and I was, I was pleasantly surprised to find out that, and this is through the guidance of, of Blake Johnson, the founder, of course, pleasantly surprised to find out that had we done the exact same thing in the exact same way, in the exact same point in the cycle, with the exact same loss curves and so on and so on, we'd have gotten through the financial crisis actually incredibly well because it's those who continue to lend into the financial crisis with the right data, infrastructure, and so on, checks and balances. Those are the ones who make it through and, and grab market share and scale while others are retreating. Mm -hmm. And so it was, a, it was a big aha moment. So version one of, of currency was – let's build a technology forward balance sheet lender. We're, we're at the right point in the cycle, 2012 now, we're at the right point in the cycle. There's the lack of liquidity and funding. It's actually back when you and I met. So there's a lack of liquidity and funding for small businesses. Let's be the first technology forward te equipment finance company in this $1.1 trillion finance market, $1.7 trillion purchase market. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Uh, we went out and found one equity investor, a high net worth individual, who's going to step in and, and really fund the business and help us execute on that strategy. Uh, we were at the finish line with a very well-known large um, U.S. bank who was going to provide us with a sizable credit facility. And literally with signature pages in my inbox, it was a very stressful time in my life, we decided that uh, the right thing to do was to not close that transaction. Wow. And this is now, this is early 2012, we would have been the only ones in our market with our strategy, with our timing, with our momentum, with our data, with our bank relationships, and we could have really done something pretty remarkable. Um, the, the reason why is that our investor had some personal things going on, and, and we collectively decided it was in all of our best interest to, to unwind the company and to return its capital. Uh, he ended up making a, a very good um, double-digit on leverage return on his money. So it was a good outcome for him. It was a, a bumpy but, but great outcome for us as well because it was that moment, which is why it's an important part of our story, where we were forced to think very carefully about our value proposition in the market. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion to our value proposition gets to a lot of how we built the business today, which is why I went through that background, which is you have to understand why customers pay you revenue. If you don't know the answer to that question, then – you're just waiting for someone else to come in and Amazon, for Amazon to come in and take your lunch, basically. Right. And so as we surveyed our customers, what we found was that there was this massive secular shift for the first time in our market with people buying equipment on the internet, mm. which sounds crazy. That, that wasn't obvious, but this is 2014 <laughs> now, not that long ago. Right. But for the first time, people were starting to buy equipment online. And so we said, okay, if that's true, how are we going to win in that market? And we concluded that we thought there were three ways to compete in specialty finance. We think you can compete with your credit guidelines, meaning I can do deals you can't do because I have more data than you. You can compete with your, with your interest rates. I can outprice the market so I can cherry pick the best deals that I want and I'll have a lower loss rate than anyone else. Or you can compete with your customer experience or how you acquire your customers. Of those three, the only one that we felt like we had a sustainable competitive advantage 
with would be how we acquire and process and, and deliver a customer experience. Mm -hmm. So that kind of led to the next iteration of the business, which I'm happy to get into, but, but that was kind of how we went from concept through near death experience through forced recognition or discovery of our value proposition to our first digital integration of the point of sale, which was eBay back in 2014. Okay. So you, you sort of rebirth the business as really an online, you know, specialty finance company. And how did you get eBay on board and what was, how did sort of you get going again? So we surveyed our customers and it was, it was hard. <laughs> it was really hard, but we surveyed our customers and they're the ones that helped us to figure out, we start our quest for equipment on eBay. They're the ones that say, we start our, our investigation or search for what we want to buy on eBay. Because and if you think about it, where else do you find a repository of endless types of equipment? And there's really not a lot of other sources. There's, there's a lot more now than there were five years ago, four years ago. But at that time, there was almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And so we said, wow, we wholeheartedly believe that financing follows purchases. And if that's true... And if the world is moving from a physical purchase to a digital purchase, which is hard to disagree with that, and if mobile is starting to just now enter into our market, then we said we need to be the first ones to, to build a digital financing experience, which implies credit decisioning, which implies credit risk, which implies a lot of things at the point of sale. So the value proposition was to eBay, we know you sell equipment. And if you sell equipment, financing has to happen. As we know, 60, 70% 60, of the equipment that's, that's purchased in the U.S. is financed. Mm -hmm. How can you sell equipment, physical equipment digitally, if you don't have a digital financing experience? And they said, that's great, but you are a subprime lender with subprime cost of capital. How are you going to service our, because we, we weren't private equity backed, we didn't have any institutional capital, we were bootstrapped, uh, bootstrapped business, and we, it was a fair question. So they said, how are you going to be able to service our A paper through basically B paper customers if you are a C priced lender? And so fortunately, because of those early lender relationships we had, those bank relationships we had back to 2001 largely, we were able to say, what if we told you we don't want to build a balance sheet? That's mm -hmm. not our end game because that's not how we think we can compete in the long run. However, we also told you we have data that no one else has on non-prime customers, which allows us when necessary to fund deals other, other people probably can't or maybe won't. Mm -hmm. And we also have banking relationships in place to allow us to deliver a digital financing experience and lay off the A paper and super prime customers to banks of the cheapest cost of capital and the most credit expertise who can hold those assets to maturity. Right. So such a valuable lesson for us. And it stepped us into, call it chapter two of the business, which was on-demand competitive financing at the digital point of sale. Mm. Okay. So before we get into that, I actually want to take a step back and just talk about the equipment finance industry. Because I know it's a, it, it is, it's a large industry, but it's a lot of, a lot of people you know, don't really know much about it. And maybe you could just tell us some of the, you know, what's, what is the size of the equipment finance industry? You know, who are the, the biggest players, so to speak? So the industry is very, very large. And let's just talk about the U.S. because the numbers on the world are, are, less, are less clear. But according to the Equipment Leasing and Financing Association, which is really the, um, the leading industry for all this information, they outsource and do research studies every single year. According to them, there's $1.7 trillion of equipment purchased in the U.S. alone every single year. And of that $1.7 trillion, 1 1.1 of that is financed. And what's interesting is that's a, I mean, that's a massive – my friends tease me because they call it a 1T market, which I appreciate. Um, right. it's, a, it's, a massive, <laughs> it's a massive industry. And what you'll find is a lot of shadow banking happens in this market. And a lot of the financing, if you look at the financial crisis, equipment – Financing was one of the best performing portfolios on return on equity risk adjusted basis uh, by comparison to treasuries, almost second to treasuries. And so if you ask that mm -hmm. question, say, well, who's participating in this market? It's, it's everybody. The largest household names that you would hear would be Bank of America leasing is huge. Wells Fargo leasing is huge. BMO Harris. Uh, a lot of these, I mean, GE Capital was the largest for a long time. So either through direct financing with, with vendor relationships or through purchasing of portfolios or through syndication or one way or another, it's the who's who, which is another way of saying it's you and I. 
It's our dollars that right. are sitting at the banks that are flowing through to middle America or to these large corporations to finance the purchase of equipment, which is so fascinating to me once I realize that. Right. And there's also obviously the captive, the captive finance companies. Cause I, I just, just, just as a little aside for the listeners, I, uh, in my, my, my previous life, I actually, I ran a printing business and we, we would buy half a million dollar printing presses. And, you know, these were, these were digital presses that we, that, that we bought through HP and we would finance through HP. In fact, actually the first one we did was through Wells Fargo, mm-hmm. who was, the, the company who had the, the relationship with the predecessor to the HP uh, press. But anyway, we would do that and it was, you know, everything, it all just ran through HP. It was all, it was all seamless. So that, and I've been on the, so I've been on the other, other side of the equation purchasing this equipment. And, you know, for when you, when you've, well, luckily we had, we had a good business. We were cash flow. We had a lot of good cash flow and we we're able to obtain these, this, this financing pretty cheaply and pretty easily. So I imagine, anyway, I imagine those captive finance companies are a decent part of the market. Well, well, they are. But what's fascinating is if you if you dig into the captive finance companies, and I won't mention any names here, but some of the largest ones that you would hear of, and possibly even an HP. But typically, what you find is either a large bank providing the funding for them, or a large bank purchasing assets from them, in, eventually. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it's fascinating that right. it, eventually, it, it usually. The two end games for equipment financing is either securitization, which means that the, the money is being dumped to insurance companies most of the time, sometimes banks, but largely insurance companies, or it's one of these large banks generating spread on the assets because it's such a mature, since the 70s, it's such a mature cottage industry. It's probably the largest cottage mature industry because it's still done physically. It's still not quite a digital experience. So the efficiencies that you've picked up in other markets haven't yet showed up here. Right. So let's talk about that because, you know, you've, as you say, you've got these people on eBay that are, that look, that are starting to look for equipment online, wanting an online experience. But, you know, equipment by its very nature is a, is a, is physical. And so what is the, the process like? And like with the, you know, with the big incumbents, um, what is the process like to finance a piece of equipment? Uh, clunky, uh, clunky at best. So if you, if you, um, <laughs> if you walk through the user experience, it starts with, how do you figure out what you want to buy? Well, today, you're probably going to start on Google. Uh, five years ago, you were going to probably talk to one of your friends in the industry and say, hey, I want to buy uh, this piece of equipment. Where do I go? And they'll probably give you a recommendation or they'll probably open up with still most of the transactions today, most customers figure out what they want to buy today through physical printed publications, almost like a physical um, mm-hmm. Craigslist, for example. Right. And, and right. so once you figure out what you want to buy, then starts the negotiation with the vendor. And you might find one or two different uh, sellers of the equipment, and there's no standardization around pricing, so you don't really know if you're getting a good deal. And let's say that you want to buy used instead of new. It gets even exponentially more complicated, but the useful life of these assets can be very long, even though the, the economic life may only be you know, five years. You might be able to use it for 15, 20 years set all the time, even in trucking, for example. And so once you figure out what you want to buy, why this industry, I believe, is still so fragmented and so large is one of the hardest problems to solve is you have to coordinate the movement of money from point A to point B at a different point in time when you move a physical good from point B to point A. Meaning, mm. if you're going to buy a large piece of construction equipment or printing, printing press, for example, if you're going to buy a printing press, Someone has to pay for the manufacturing of that printing press. And once it's manufactured, there's cash that had to be spent to put that together. And so the next question is, will that vendor, that seller of the printing press, be comfortable shipping you the printing press without you paying them? Probably not. Right. The answer is no. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, that's the time. So, yeah. so, when you, so when you think about the mechanics of that, it's not like you put a printing press in your backseat and drive it home then it becomes exponentially more complicated. And then you start to understand why there's so much margin in this industry, frankly, and why it hasn't gone through major revolution. It's already working really well. It's clunky, but people are making really good money. And you, the rate of purchases isn't frequent enough in your life for you to care about the pain. It's kind of like you know going to the dentist. It's not fun, but if you only do it twice a year, you can stomach it. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about what currency offers because you, when you on on your uh, on your website, when you talk about the different solutions you guys offer, you have the currency API, 
lending services and currency pay. So why don't you just talk us through, let's just start with the currency API. What What is that and how does it work? So it all it all connects back to our conclusion we came up with, with that story I shared about how we were uh, overworked, underpaid, and, and definitely underfunded back in 2013, 2014. And so it forced us to really own our value proposition and, and figure out why do customers pay us. And the conclusion was we help customers figure out the answers to two questions, which are, what do you want to buy and how do you want to pay? What do you want to buy and how do you want to pay? And what's fascinating about this, this market is similar to the mortgage industry in the 90s. And if you follow the, the story of the lending tree business model, we're following a very similar trajectory where they started as, as a lead gen company, but none of the banks had call centers. So they didn't know what to do with the leads. And then they became a lender and then they became a whole loan sale provider. Then they became just a technology platform. And there were lots of flips and starts in there. But what we found is that there's, mm-hmm. there's three components to our business um, built by the assumption that in the long run, uh, our best value proposition is delivering a wonderful experience for the customer the customer being the buyer and seller of the equipment and also the lender. We have three customers or the lender slash investor. Mm -hmm. And so if that's true, we need to be able to provide services for all three, answering the questions, what do you want to buy and how do you want to pay for it? So the, what do you want to buy is figuring out what type of equipment do you want to buy from which vendor? How do you know that vendor? Is that a credible vendor? Is that a good vendor? Is that a bad vendor? What's the reputation of that? And so a very consultative approach for that. But the next question is, how do you want to pay? through debit, credit, ACH, wire transfer, or through financing. Well, we grew up in the financing world, and so we were forced to develop an expertise around the shipping, delivery, installation, which is a whole other conversation we won't even have time to get into today. But it was a lot easier for us to step into the payment side of the equation because we'd already solved the financing side, which happens 60 to 70% of the time. But what we realized that starting in 2014, when we made this bet that transactions were moving from physical to digital, we had to be the first ones to deliver a digital experience. There's so many lenders, uh, I use the word lenders in, on purpose, some are banks, some are alter- alternative finance companies who have not yet made that same decision that we made, which was we're betting the future on this being digital, on this being mobile, on this being talk, uh, voice to text, that we started renting, actually say differently, people started coming to us saying, can we borrow, can we rent your technology to take our process and make it digital. And so that's currency API is it's alternative finance companies and banks coming to us. Uh, so we recently, really proud of this. There, there was a community bank uh, in, the, in the Midwest that is now renting, using our technology, they're renting our technology from us. And they've been able to displace a very large bulge bracket bank from a vendor relationship because now they can compete with the timing and the processing and they have a, a desire to fund in their local market. So if there's a transaction in this local market, because of our technology platform, we took them from physical paper, Excel, best case scenario to now an entirely digital um, from application to funding process. Okay. So that's sort of, that, that's really you know, it's a lending as a service type uh, type product. But so are you, are you also doing the underwriting? Like are they using your underwriting tools or is it really just the technology itself? Well, let me, let me qualify that a little bit. Going back to the view that long-term, we think it's really hard to say your competitive advantage is I can out underwrite you um, because that's so nuanced for different reasons. Right. So rather than mm-hmm. take that stance, now we do have a lending component to our business because we've been forced to because we live through a financial crisis and we understand that and we know what we know our credit box, which we feel good about, which I mentioned is valuable for a lot of our partners. But for banks such as the one I mentioned earlier, what we do is we actually take their credit model and we code it into our technology and we take their credit appetite and we, and we put it into our system okay. and we say, if a deal falls into this rubric, then deliver this approved application to the lender and ask them to say, do I want it? Yes or no. Mm, okay. Okay. So then, so there's that piece. And so, so you said you also have your own balance sheet that you're lending out as well. Did I hear you right when you, you are providing actual loans off your own balance sheet? We are, we are doing that as well. Okay. Okay. And then what, what about currency pay? What is that exactly? So currency pay is helping people move money from point A to point B. There's not a lot of solutions for, we'll call it high ticket items, high ticket being qualified as more than $2,000. There's not a lot of solutions for in the digital environment being able to pay for something over $2,000. 
it's possible. Okay. So, I mean, obviously, you, credit cards, you can you can go. I mean, I think our American we found, I found out our American Express limit is fifty thousand right now. So we can. You know, that's you know, there. Obviously, are um, the credit cards do that? But what? What? So t- say more. So you are in this super elite portion of the market. <laughs> if you have a uh, an Amex balance that gets you up to fifty thousand, so I'll, I'll share this story. I don't mind um, this being on the record. Uh, a few years ago, I and I've had thanks to business school and other uh, other things, I've had uh, lots of debt, we'll say, that I've had on my personal credit that I've borrowed and repaid over the years. And a few years ago, um, I went through the PayPal credit process. I mean, I've, I've paid over you know, six, six figures of debt on my credit report uh, over the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. I've been, been a business owner for over um, 12, 15 years as well. So I went through the pay, PayPal credit process, and despite my which I'm very proud of, very high credit score and very deep credit background, I was only approved for $1,300. So mm-hmm. if, and I'm saying this like with a, with a college degree, with a master's degree, with being a business owner for more than a decade, with having very deep credit profile, with understanding the credit markets you know, more than the average person, if I only got approved for $1,300, what's the average business owner probably, the average small business owner probably able to get approved for? It's probably not much more than that. There, there are those businesses that do have six-figure balances with American Express, and, and that's not the market that we're going after directly. But for the mom-and-pop restaurant owner, business owner, truck driver, that's probably not an option for them. So for everybody else, right. now that behavior is shifting. So let me give you these metrics. These are pretty fascinating. If you add in uh, eBay and a couple of other partners in the eBay category, and you take all their volume, and you can qualify this with some of the Ritchie Brothers data as well, with a large online, with a large auctioneer, our best guess is that according to measurable data, there's no more than 10, maybe 12 billion dollars of equipment sold electronically in the U.S. every year. Hmm. Out of the 1.7 trillion total. Correct. So t- take that number and multiply it times five. Take it to 50 billion. 50 billion out of 1.7 trillion. So the the secular bet that we're making on is people are going to have to figure out. How do you move money from point A to point B at a different point in time when you move an asset from point B to point A? And that's sometimes going to be financing. Sometimes it's going to be ACH, debit, or it'll be credit, or it'll be a wire. But you can't do that unless you can also manage the logistics and create trust amongst three mistrusting parties, the finance provider, the seller, and the buyer. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. No, that makes sense. I, I see. I see the, you know, that, and you know, like 50 billion is what's well, that's 3% of the market, I guess, of 1.7. So there's, uh, and eventually, I mean, I imagine, you know, eventually it's going to be 100%. I mean, I don't know if there's going to be in 10 years' time things that are not happening digitally. Maybe there is. Maybe it'll take decades to get it to 100%. But certainly, you're going to get a lot more than one or two percent, which yeah, that's just that's, that's it's it's completely inevitable. I don't think anyone could really argue against that. I think uh, that yeah, you know, and it sounds like what you guys are doing is facilitating the acceleration of that. So then I want to talk a little bit about the data analytics technology because you've got a, it, it's it's a unique. You know, you, you, this is not really just like a small business loan mm-hmm. because small business loan you've got a small business you've got a lender here. You've really got you've got you said you've got three parties and you've got the piece of equipment as well itself, which is really a fourth entity, even though it's 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 inanimate, but it's uh you know, it is part of the it's part of the, the thinking. So how do you how do you get all gather all the data to to make an informed decision there? Well, let's go take a question one step further. Uh, I think about what do you do with the data once you have it and how do you translate it into into value and for who? And so what we're trying to do is to be able um, to empower transactions at the point of sale for A through D credits and every type of asset purchase online. That's our end game. And so all of our view on data is filtered around that because what we found is, and we went down the path of saying, well, we can build a better credit model. What we found is that if we, if we put our name to our credit model and then we market that credit model to the capital markets, and they use our credit models to make credit decisions, then it works until it doesn't, or it works until it potentially doesn't with how fickle things are today. And so we said, well, well, we don't want to put our stamp on saying we can do credit better than anyone else. Uh, there's other people doing that and, and commend them for being able to do that, but that's not the bet we're making. 
what we want to be able to do is build an end-to-end -end equipment purchase and financing exchange and be able to use all the data that we're gathering to help people optimize the unit economics on the equipment that they're using. Because if people can use their equipment to generate more revenue more often, then that makes the entire ecosystem work better. Does that make sense? Right. No, I get, I get that. I get that. Okay. So we're running out of time and I want to get to a couple more things here. The f firstly, I want, to, I want you to talk. I'm actually looking at your face right now on the website. And, and my face is on there too. <laughs> That's interesting. C so the CEMC, the Commercial Equipment Marketplace Council that you founded uh, just a couple of years ago, I believe. So tell us, tell us about a little bit about this organization and, and why you decided, why you founded it. Sure. Well, the, the purpose of the CEMC is to bring together the best and the brightest from the, the fintech world and the equipment finance world and bring them together. We, we believe what you just said, which is it's inevitable that technology changes how things are being done in this market. And we're already seeing it today. Uh, we're seeing it in a, in a very, very quick clip. It's accelerating the rate of change here. And so when we were first having these conversations in 2011, 2012, we were told point blank by multiple people, you're going to go out of business for using DocuSign. You're crazy. Electronic signatures are never going to hold out in court. You're going to go out of business. Whereas the whole world is now moving towards DocuSign and the equipment finance industry is, is just now adopting it at a pretty quick pace. And so we said, well, okay, we want to be among, we want a vibrant market with lots of competition because that will speed innovation up. And our end game is to really build a new ecosystem, a new exchange where we can help facilitate these transactions across all sorts of credit parties, all sorts of investors, all sorts of, of sellers of equipment. And we want to be the hub that, that empowers these transactions. If that's true, and we need to bring together all of our partners, and if we're not trying to compete on cost of capital, we're not trying to compete on credit guidelines, we don't want to be a balance sheet lender in the long run. That's a temporary step for us to get to the next lily pad. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we want to pull together everyone who touches the, the value chain of figuring out what do you want to buy, how do you want to pay, get them all in a room, deliver a world-class experience, and, and force the conversation to think about what's artificial intelligence going to do to our market? How is talk to text going to change things? What if you had a blank sheet of paper and you didn't care about the math? What would be the next product that you would invent for the customer? Probably something around shared economy, probably something around um, Internet of Things connected back to, I mean, John Deere is doing a lot of this stuff. I didn't know that before we had him come and mm -hmm. come to our conference and talk about it. And so the purpose of CEMC mm -hmm. is to, to drive that conversation forward, to bring technology to our market at, at the cost, probably, frankly, of margin, at the cost of margin short term, but long term, by re-architecting this industry to have it be oriented in the way that it should be going to build long term sustainable value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I should have, as I just mentioned as well. I, I spoke at your event last year, which is why it's on the website here. And it's you know really a uh, it was it was a great event, opened by eyes. I, I'd, I'd never actually met, I'd never talked to many people in the equipment finance space, and uh, it really was it was it was quite fascinating. Anyway, we're just we're out of time, but before we go, just just maybe a, a few thoughts on what your vision is for currency. <laughs> oh man. My hope is, uh, when I look back on my career, that, you know, and call it 20, 30, 40 years from today, that I can look back on this market and feel very good that I left a lasting, lasting impact on how people buy and sell equipment, and I helped to eliminate fraud, and I helped people to optimize their usage of their equipment. That'd be, that would be success for me. And fortunately, I, I get to work with a lot of my best friends. Uh, and I think this problem is really hard and really interesting. It's not going to be solved overnight. But if we could pull all those things off and enjoy the process along the way, that would be my vision for myself and for, for currency over call it the next couple of decades here. Okay, well, we'll have to leave it there. Well, good, good luck with that, Charles. Uh, that, that certainly is a, a noble mission. And uh, I appreciate you coming on the show today. Right on. Well, thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure to, to do this with you today. I'm honored. Okay. We'll catch you later. Thanks. Bye. Take care. It is truly fascinating to me that an industry the size of equipment finance, he said $1.1 trillion financed each year. I mean, that's one of the biggest verticals we have. And yet it is still not 
being dominated by fintech players. There, you know, there really is a traditional financing finance industry that operates pretty much the same way they did a decade ago. And you know, but as I said, it's it's inevitable that this will this will be moved online. Everything else is moving online, and and companies like Currency are really accelerating this process. And I, I, I think you know, when the times when I was out at his event and spoke to some of these lenders, and they are traditional folks and have done things the same way for sometimes decades and and they just now starting to think well we should learn about how we can really digitize what we're doing and i think it's really a, they're a decade behind some of the other verticals but as i said it's inevitable that they will catch up and this will be a digital experience will be commonplace here within the not too distant future anyway on that note i will sign off i very much appreciate you listening and i'll catch you next time bye Today's show was sponsored by Lendit Fintech USA 2019, the world's leading event in financial services innovation. It's coming up on April 8th through 9th, 2019 at Moscone West in San Francisco. Registration is now open and we're also taking speaker applications. You can find out more by going to lendit.com slash USA.